we're in a new series. Um, this, uh, we started this month. It's called His Divine Design. <laughs> you and I were His divine design, right? Everything God created <coughs> is His divine design. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the Word of God. It brings life. Changes us, challenges us. Father, gives us revelations so that we can live this life in a way that, that blesses you and that glorifies your name, blesses us too as well. Lord, open up our ears to hear the word of God this morning. Help us to receive it with faith, believe it, receive it, walk it out in our life. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. I'm talking about his house, his glory. You know, it's so good. It's so good to be in the house of God, isn't it? So, do, you know, the house of God is his, his house, is his church. It's all about his church. You know, and it's, it's God's plan A, and there is no plan B, isn't it? You know, and I love the house. I love the church. I love the church that Jesus loved so much that he died for. You know, I love the church that David loved so much that he said words like, all the days of my life, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? And he says stuff like, one day, just one day in your courts, Lord, is better than a thousand days elsewhere. I'd rather just be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the, uh, of, of the wicked. I love the church. I love the house of God. And David said in Psalm 26, verse 8, Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where you're what? Your glory dwells. <clears throat> you studied the Word of God. You studied the Bible, right from cover to cover. And you know it's all about Him. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. But listen, it's all about His house from cover to cover. So look from right from the get-go. Right in the first book in the, in, the, in the written Word of God is Genesis. In Genesis chapter 28, we look at the life of Jacob. Jacob, in Genesis chapter 28, he has a dream. And he uses his rock as a pillow. And then he wakes up. And it says, Jacob woke up from his dream, and he said, God is in this place. Truly, I didn't even know it. He was terrified. He whispered in awe, incredible, wonderful, holy. This is God's house. This is the gate of heaven. He nailed it right there. He nailed what God's house was all, was all about. You know, and he said, you know, Lord, you know, you're in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. So many people are unaware of the presence of God. Well, Jacob called this place Bethel, which means the house of God. And he takes this pillow and he turns it into a pillar. And, 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 and all of Jacob's children from that time used to go back to that place of, to, of Bethel to worship God until the time of Moses. And Moses in Exodus 25, God gives Moses instructions designed a pattern, dimensions for building this place called the tabernacle. In Exodus 25, verse 9, he tells Moses, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And it was meticulous, meticulously made, construction, constructed, designed, using all the specific materials that God had told him. It was a tabernacle. It was a tent. Tabernacle means to dwell. It's also a verb and a, and a noun. It's God's dwelling place. And in this tabernacle, in the most holy place, was this article. And, uh, and it's right on the top left-hand side. It was called the Ark of God's. It was the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And maybe you have some uh, sense of what it is by watching the readers of the Lost Ark, right? But, but if you don't know much about the Bible. But, but it was this piece of furniture, an exquisite piece of furniture, covered in gold. And on top of that, 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 uh, uh, of that ark was the, the, wings, the wings of a cherubim. It was called cherubim, which were angels of God. And that was in a place in that tent, that tabernacle, in a place called the most holy place. There was an, there was an outer court, there was an inner court, and then there was a place that was most holy. And that's where that, that article, that the ark stood. And whenever the high priest would come in to minister, he would, he would walk into that place, and the glory of God would come and settle right between the wings of the cherubim, and, 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 that would, and God would dwell there. So this tabernacle was really just a big tent that they would take up and they would take down through their desert, desert travelings. So it was a tabernacle and it was a tent until 
the time of David and Solomon. A th in the, year of, the year was about 1000 BC. S in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, 22, 1 Chron Chronicles 22, and David wants to build a temple to honor the name of his God. But God says, no, you, David, you're not going to build it, but you're going to help your son Solomon to build it. And that's what the scripture says. So at the end of his life, what David does, he stockpiles all his treasure, all his wealth for what he deems as most important, for what he loves the most. So he pours all his life savings into what is most important. He builds a house. He helps Solomon. So Solomon builds God's house. And listen, it is the most magnificent, glorious building the world has ever seen. Has, in fact, probably the most magnificent stru structure that has ever built, been built or, or ever will be built in this world. And it took literally the wealth of nations to build this temple. The wealth of many, many nations. In fact, the estimation in today's value would be somewhere between two to three trillion dollars went into the construction of that temple. The artistry, the workmanship, the meticulousness, the design, everything exquisitely. An incredible, incredible building. And this was the house of worship for almost 500 years. But 470 but 470 years later, it was destroyed by the king of Babylon. The people started to fall away from God, worship other, other idols. So God allowed the king of Babylon to come and to come into the kingdom, decimate the kingdom, destroy that temple, take all the wealth of the treasuries. And the people went into captivity for 70 years. But 70 years after that, later, a guy named Zerubbabel, he led the exiles back. And what was a, a nation of hundreds of thousands were suddenly shrunk down to somewhere between 50 to 80,000 people. But these 50 to 80,000 people lived in that land, that foreign land, for 70 years. And they wanted to worship God. And so they wanted, they said, we need to rebuild the temple. So a guy named Zerubbabel, it's hard to say, <laughs> <clears throat> led that movement with other people like Z uh, and contemporaries like Nehemiah and Ezra <clears throat> and Haggai. And so they rebuilt that temple. And Haggai, in chapter 2, verse 9, prophesies. And he says this, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than, the for than, than of the former, saith the Lord. And in this place I will give peace. The glory of of this latter house will be greater than the former house. The former house he was talking about was the temple of Solomon, right? But listen, but the reality is when these exiles returned and that, that temple was rebuilt, they were disappointed. They were disappointed because that temple was not as great as the former temple. It cost about a third of the resources. It was a, it was a third of the workmanship the beauty, the artistry. But what Haggai was talking about was not about this rebuilt temple of, under Zerubbabel. He was actually, you know what he was doing? He was pointing to Jesus. Amen. Pointing to Jesus. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and all the gates of hell will not come against it. And that prophecy that Haggai prophesied was pointing to the glory of a new covenant where the glory of God will dwell in you and us by Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the glory. That's the glory he was talking about. So Jesus tells his disciples to get together in one place, wait and pray. And the church in Acts chapter 2 was born. Boom! The Holy Spirit came down. The church was born. And throughout that New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes back to the church that was born in the book of Acts, in Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Hebrews, all the letters were written back to the church. And this is what he says about us, the church. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 to 22. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints 
and the members of the household of God haven't been built. And wow, what a royal, magnificent history our church that we are living into has, right? Haven't been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ being the corn, chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place, a habitation of God in the Spirit. Wow, what a magnificent church we belong to. Amen? So think about it. What are you talking about? From a pillar to a tent. From the tent to a temple. From the temple to the church. From Jacob to Moses to David and Solomon to Jesus and the early and the and the New Testament church to the to revelations and even further right than that to the heavenly city to the heavenly church the place that you and I will be for eternity all of that it's all about his church all about his church I want to tell you I love the church because it's a place where his glory dwells so precious this message is entitled His House, His Glory. And I says, if there's anything we need, is we need the glory of God. Yeah. If there's everything we should desire, we should covet, it's the glory of God. Yeah. If there's anything Canada needs, it's the glory of God. Yeah. If they, this world needs, it's the glory of God. Yeah. It's, if there's anything in you need, it's the glory of God. It's what everybody needs. Everybody needs Jesus, and everybody needs a home. Everybody needs God's house, amen? And the reason people need, need his house is because who is here in the house, amen? Now, it was Micah chapter 4, verse 1. Micah prophesied, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream to worship there. All over the world will come. Why? Because the glory of the Lord is in his house. The glory is God's presence. Wherever his glory is, people are going to come. The glory, that word glory is actually the Hebrew word kabod, which literally means weight or heaviness. It's almost like a blanket. It means splendor. It means his abundance. It means his honor. It means his glory. It means his dignity, his reverence, and his majesty is in the house. Amen? In the house of God. You know, we used, to, you know, a glory is, I say, it's glory's prominence. It says radiance. It's the visible manifestation of the character of God in the house. Amen? We used to sing songs like, I wish I, 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 wish I was a singer. <laughs> oh, I, I could give you, I could give, the, it, would, it would make such a difference, right? We used to sing songs like this. Lord, let your glory fall in this place. Let it go from here to the nations. Let your kingdom be established in this place as we gather to seek your face. Something like that. We, t we, we sang about the glory. We asked for the glory to come. Matt Regman used to say, I remember a song that Matt Redman used to talk, it was, he sing, it, was called, it was called, Lord, let your glory fall. Let your glory fall, like on that ancient day. And he says, you are good, you are good, and your love endures today, today, today it's still about Jesus. Today it's still about his house, amen? Today, it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. You know, I want to tell you, this place, this house, this isn't a Christian version of the Kinsman Club or the Elks Club. This isn't, this isn't about social experience. No, this is not a place, just a place where our kids come into a Sunday school program so they could be better placed. It, it is part of that, but it's not just that. And this is not just a place of social justice. And I want to tell you, this is not a place of entertainment. This is not where we do Christian karaoke. We, this is not a sing-along. This is a worship, house of worship. 
Amen? Not being entertained. We're not wild by the people who perform. Our eyes are fixed on him. Amen? It's still about him. This is God's house, the place where he dwells, the place of his kabod, the place where lives are changed because people are in his presence, experience his power, his love, and his kindness. You know, I don't know how many people I've talked to in the past who have said, you know, I felt, who have came the first time, they said, I felt something here. There was something like this energy. You know, I say how often tears had flowed from our eyes during worship, and we felt this heaviness kind of just lift off, off of us. This fear left, even depression kind of leaves. It's, it's, you know what, it's, 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 it's his presence. It's, it's his glory in the house, amen? So I want to ask you, how many here want his glory to fill the house? Yeah? yeah? How many want to see more of his presence in the house? How many, how many of us want to be filled to overflowing with his Holy Spirit? Yeah. How many want more of his presence, his more glory, his glory to increase? Yeah. No, God's glory, God's presence is to be in his house, not just by potential, not just by proxy or promise, but to be, a, to be visibly tangible in his house. That's what the glory was meant to be, in the house of God. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to tell you, <coughs> Excuse me. I think there's a. You just grab that water for you, for me. Thank you. <coughs> I want to be honest with you. I want to see God's glory. I've been pastoring. We've been pastoring for like almost 30 years, and we 40 years, and we've tasted part of God's glory when we first came into the kingdom. But God, I'm saying, God, we need your glory in the house again. We need your glory. Wow, wow. You know, and we be honest for the most part. The glory, the kabod of God is no longer sensed in most churches. And, and I believe this, but God hasn't left the church. God is, the church is God's answer. He's, the church is the hope of the world. He hasn't left his church. But I want to tell you, but that glory presence is not here, not in the churches, in the dimension and the magnitude that it could be and it should be. Amen? You know, I was sharing about Karen and I. Karen and I, we came into the kingdom of God during this, or the, during this time called the charismatic movement. And that really kind of dates us, doesn't it? We're just, we're just like teenagers, right? <laughs> we're 12 and 13. <coughs> and it was, a late, it was the very tail end of the 70s in the, into the very earlies. And I tell you, when, I, when we came into, I, that's the time we came into the kingdom. And when I came into that, in that, in, in that time, man, we saw people we saw young people, we saw hippies. It was like hippie time, you know, flower child, you know, flower power and peace and all that kind of stuff. You know, but we saw people, we saw young people, we saw teenagers, there were drug addicts, there were hopeless addicts, there were alcoholics come into church and get born again by the Spirit of God. Delivered of alcoholism, there's them saved. I, and we saw so many people in, the, in, in our in our, I saw people that used to sit and hang around with the bars before I was born again. I saw people that I knew. I saw people that I, that I, I knew like, like, like many of the people. I saw those very young people, young men, young women, teenagers, young adults, come into the church, into the glory of God, and get richly, powerfully born again and saved. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and I saw so many people. It was amazing how the, it, was, it was the glory of God was in the church at that time. And what a difference it made. We experienced the kabod of God. Every revival in history experienced this heightened awareness. And not only the awareness of God, the manifestation of God's glory in his love, in his power, it was in his church. And Karen and I were privileged to experience two other revivals in our life. We went to Toronto. We experienced the, the outpouring of God's spirit in this place called Toronto, Ontario. We were also, and that was in the um, early 90s. In the, in the late 90s, we went to Pensacola, Florida. We saw a powerful salvation uh, uh, revival. It was absolutely amazing. It was mind-blowing. And, you know, and I know there, has been, there have been many revivals uh, throughout history. But I want to tell you, there is a great revival, an unprecedented yeah. revival that is coming to his church. Yeah. Amen? And we are going to see literally 
hundreds, thousands, and possibly millions being swept into the kingdom of God because the power of God, His might, His majesty, His kabod will be experienced by those people in the house of God. Amen? Amen. I should quit preaching right now. And I've already done it. I want you to see, you know, the question is, why was, this, why was the, the glory of God coming into the church at that time? What was it about it? Why did he come? How, and what, why did he come? And where did he come? And, and what was it that made this presence of God appear in the house of God? So I want you to see what happened in the dedication of, this, of Solomon's temple. Remember we talk about that magnificent temple? I want to talk about that. I want, to see, I want you to see something. It took seven years to build that temple. Up to three trillion dollars. Laborers. I mean, this, this magnificent temple is finally completed. So I want you to see three essentials. Three essentials for the glory, the God of God that fill this house. Glory fill that house in a powerful way. And those three things are this. Personal purity, corporate unity, and extravagant worship. Now, now let's look at now. Let's see if you can spot those. Let's read this. Second Chronicles 5, 4. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the Levites took up the ark, and they brought up the ark. Remember that ark of the covenant? And the tent of the meeting, and all the sacred furnishings, and they brought it into this house. Go to verse 6. And King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel. You know how many that was? Somewhere, scholars estimate between 800,000 to a million people were in that kingdom of Israel at that time. Had gathered around him and were before the ark. Can you picture a million people in front of standing in that, that temple? And they were sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. Wow. The cattle producers in this, in, in Alberta, we've been excited about that. And when the priests had come out of the holy place, for all the priests present had, now listen, sanctified themselves, separating themselves from everything that edifies. Number one, personal purity. Purity in the house. Okay? Verse 12. And all the Levites who were singers, all of those of Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, with, all, with their sons and kinsmen, arrived in fine linen, having cymbals, harps, lyres, stood at the east end of the altar, and with him, 120 priests, priests blowing trumpets. Wow. And 13, and when the trumpets and the singers were joined in unison, making one sound, corporate unity, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the other instruments for song, and praise the Lord, saying, for he is good. For his mercy and loving kindness endure forever extravagant worship. Then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Wow. Wow. Today we are seeing what God has promised that he would do in this world. God is shaking the earth. God is shaking the world. I have never in my life ever seen such shaking in so many countries, so many nations, even in our city. Should have been here on Friday morning in front of the courthouse. There is a shaking going on. And what God is doing is he is shaking worldly systems. He is shaking governments. He is deposing and expo he's exposing, deposing, and he's putting his will and his people in places. There is something going on. Not only that, he's shaking the demonic realm and is causing this darkness, this collision. But I want to tell you also, he's shaking his church. Amen. Judgment begins first in the house of God. He's shaking the church. Now, why? Because he wants to remove the stuff that has kept the power out of the house of God and out of our lives. Amen? The first essential to see the glory of God filling the house is number one, personal 
purity. Psalm 24 is an incredible song. Psalm 24 is a wake-up song to God's people. It's coming alive today. Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, whose hands and hearts are pure, and who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. And you read through this psalm, and then there's this, this, this word, it's called interlude, or pause in that psalm. And this pause is a prelude to prepare you for what's, there's a holy emphasis there. <laughs> Am I still on? <laughs> I'm just going to keep going, okay? It'll come back. Don't worry. Okay. There's a holy pause. And this holy pause, this holy, is it, this interlude is a holy pause that allows us to burst into this chorus. And the words are, open up ancient gates. Open up ancient doors. Let the king of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, invincible in battle. Open up ancient doors. Open up ancient, ancient gates, ancient doors. And let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's army. He is the King. And you can go right into the presence of God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Listen to Paul regarding personal purity. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. You are the temple. 
of the Holy Spirit. His divine design. Together we are the living stones that make up the house of God. We are his house. We are his temple. You are his temple. Amen? Amen. Sex outside of marriage is still fornication. It's a sin in God's eyes. No matter what the world says, no matter even what some Christian friends may tell you, it's a sin in God's eyes. It's a scarlet sin, and it deeply affects your spirit. Amen? So we use the blood of Christ. Repent, turn around. Purity isn't popular these days, but it's absolutely essential to the glory of God in your life and in the house of God. The more we're filled of him, the less of us is in us. Amen? Amen. You want the closeness with God? You want his power, his presence, his Holy Spirit, right? Then go to God. Repent of your sins. Use the blood of Christ to purify yourself. Amen? Amen. Number two, corporate unity. Corporate unity, 2 Chronicles 5.13. It says, when the trumpeters and the singers were joined in unison, making one sound, 120 trumpets playing one note, a unanimous sound, one sound, like in the book of, uh, book of Acts, they were all together in unity, in harmony, in one accord, in prayer. And what happened? Boom! The glory fell. Holy Spirit came down. Power. Do you remember that story? Acts chapter 2? Unity. So important. Psalm 133, King James Version. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And verse 6 says, For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Corporate unity. How good and pleasant. That's where the Lord commands the blessing. blessing. That's where the victory is. That's where the joy is. Amen? That's where his presence is, where there is unity. <clears throat> and it was Jesus' prayer. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It's proof. The greatest tool of evangelism for the church is unity. Amen? When people see unity in, their ch in the church, they are blown away because they don't see it anywhere else. Number three, got to move on. Third one, extravagant worship. Second Chronicles 5.13 said they lifted up their voice, their voice, lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and other instruments and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy and his loving kindness endure forever. Now, I, I brought some background on, on that event and what they were singing. And some scholars, theologians believe that what they were actually doing is they were reciting Psalm 136. If you read Psalm 136, it's an amazing psalm because it, it starts out by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. It's a simple song. Just a chorus, just a united thankfulness. It was loud, it was joyful, it was, it was sincere. 26 times those Levitical police, priests would say something about God in praise to him, something about his majesty, his creation, his mighty acts, his conquest, his acts of love. 26 times they would say something, and then 26 times the people standing in front would respond together, his love endures forever. His love endures forever. And at that moment, the 26th time, the glory of God, at that moment of extravagant worship, the power of God, God came down. Wow. Wow. Today, today, the glory is Jesus dwelling in our hearts by faith, by his Holy Spirit. Today, you and I, we are to be vessels, carriers, of the glory of God in our life. God didn't ordain that. So I'm done. Question, question. Who wants the glory of God to fill the house? Yeah. Who wants the glory of God to fill it? Who wants to be a vessel for his glory? Amen? Then do these three things that I told you about. Number one, let the blood of Christ cleanse you continually every single day. Secondly, come together. Let's come together as a church in unity. When you see disunity, you see that's not right. Let's get our hearts right. Amen? And third, 
when we come, come next week, come every week, come with thanks and praise and exuberant, extravagant worship. Amen? Amen. And we do those three things, just those three elements. And I tell you, eternity will open up and the glory of God will fill this house. Amen? Amen? Bow your heads. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this word. Lord, let us not forget this word. Let us be so cognizant, aware of Jesus and your presence and what's in our hearts. Lord, that we can repent every time and we can receive healing, forgiveness, return of joy and peace, the abundant life that you promised us. Thank you, Father. Let the word do its work, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Just keep your head, eyes closed, heads bowed. I want to say this. I want to pray for somebody. And maybe you don't know Jesus, but I want to tell you, this is the day of salvation. This is the day of favor of God on your life. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the good thing. Jesus paid for your sins. Every single one, his precious blood, his broken body, pay for the price, your sins. God did it all. It's called the gift of salvation. It's the greatest gift you could ever receive this side of heaven. And it's unmerited, it's totally unearned. All you need to do is believe in Jesus and just receive him into, into your heart today by faith. Be ready to surrender up your, surrender your old ways and your old lifestyle. Be ready to receive this new life, this incredible thing called a relationship with God eternity in heaven. So if that's you, and you're ready, I want to lead you in a, just a simple prayer that will change your life for eternity forever. And you'll never be sorry that you did this. So if you're ready, sincere, then when you bow your heads, close your eyes, and say this after me, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you died and you shed your blood on the cross to pay for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me of every sin that I have ever committed. Today and now, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my heart. I ask you to come into my heart, to be Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen and amen.